Thank you, Brother Dalton, for that. Aren't you glad you came to church tonight? Amen. Your heart's been touched already? Yeah. Man, I've been encouraged. I, again, thank all those involved in our music uh, ministry here at First Baptist Church. Appreciate the hard work you do. And thanks for all those who are involved in the technical and the video, audio side of things. I don't thank you enough, but those men and ladies who work with that, the sound and the screens and the video cameras and all that, takes a lot of, uh, of manpower to make, to make those things come together. Every once in a while, you may see or hear a mistake. That's when people look. If you hear a microphone squeal, you look at the sound guy. What's wrong with him? You know, well, a lot's wrong with him, but not in that regard. <laughs> or you see something on the video screen that doesn't line up as soon as you wish it would line up, right? And say, oh, my goodness. And, you know, we try to do our best here, but I appreciate all the ladies and men who work with that. Uh, around here at First Baptist Church, an unseen a, a part of that in the background. So thank you so much for doing that. We don't take you for granted in any way, shape, or form. But man, I'm glad to be at church. Yeah. If your heart hasn't been touched yet, you may need to move closer to the front. <laughs> I say, well, Pastor, I can't do that. You, don't you know that my grandfather got me this seat when I first came here? And, uh, you know, I can't, I can't move from this seat that I have. It has my name on it. And actually, uh, and actually uh, I've registered this seat with the county, and it's my particular seat. Well, <laughs> be that as it may, you might find that you enjoy the front. Isn't that right, Miss Robinson? It's not so bad up here. Only downside I see is sitting in front of Brother Goldsworthy. And uh, <laughs> even that's not too bad. And so we're glad you're here. If you have your Bibles, open to Exodus chapter number 20. Exodus chapter number 20 began this morning. Uh, with that and and as we look at this theme this year only God I'm praying that our hearts will be turned and challenged and turned back to only God there are so many other things that take the place of only God but all you and I need all this world needs is help me only God you know what the United States of America needs only God. You know what your family needs? Only God. You know what your neighbor, all right, who may have a life that's upside down needs? You know what they need? Help me. Only your co-worker? What is it? Only God. You know what your marriage needs? Whether you're saved or unsaved, your marriage. Only God. We need only God. And yet so many things crowd into that real estate. So many things want to threaten the space that is supposed to be only God's. I entitled the message, I Pledge Allegiance. I preached the first part this morning. I want to remind you along the way, though, that if you've not gotten one yet in the back table, there are the mugs, only God on them. Now, one reason we have some things here, a little pen and a, and a notepad, is so that when you get up in the morning and you put some coffee in this mug... Coffee in this mug. There are some that would want to put something else in this mug and post it on Facebook. I'm not one to pick on people at church. You think I don't know these things? I lurk. These are for coffee, bless God. But maybe, just maybe, as you pick up your cup in the morning, you'll be reminded that today will be about only God. When you scribble a note on this notepad or with that pen, that maybe, just maybe, my heart, my desire, my prayer would be that you'd see that verse, John 17, 3, and your heart would be turned back, and you think, you know what? I today need only God. Now, Lord willing, in a couple months, we'll have some other things to, to give to you. One of those things being a magnet. We did not launch the year with a magnet, and I heard quite the complaints. <laughs> you know who you are. You know who you are out there. I would point you to that song, I Have Been Blessed. <laughs> but I'll get you some magnets if we can, Lord willing. But my desire, is it not God's desire that in the space of my soul, that only he would occupy it. That he would have not just the top space and the top place, though that's rightfully his, we looked at that this morning, but all the space. Why should anything crowd out the Lord in my heart? 
than my life? Why should anything begin to push him to the side? Why should anything threaten his place in my life? The place that's supposed to be reserved for only God. Yet, if I'm honest, and if you're honest, many things, many objects, many ideas, many feelings threaten, begin to invade with the desire to push out God himself. For whatever reason, I don't know the answer to this one. For whatever reason, God has allowed us to be able to push him out. He could have made it so that we automatically keep him right here. Could he not? He's God. He could have made it so that we only choose him. But he didn't. He allows us to push him out. Exodus chapter 20, we have the passage known as the Ten Commandments. The first time here they're spoken to the children of Israel. Ten Commandments being a familiar passage to many, even those that are, who don't claim the name of Jesus Christ often know about the Ten Commandments from the Bible. The Ten Commandments being shoved and ripped down from our public square, courtrooms, schools, businesses, with the idea that God has no place there. Oh, my friend, if they only knew that what they need is only God. But tonight, can I draw your attention back to this passage, Exodus chapter 20, beginning in verse number 1, and the Lord and God spake all these words, saying, I am am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. Lord, I ask for your help. Lord, we need you tonight, and we only need you. Lord, I ask that our hearts would be open to your truth. Jesus gave us the example of good soil. And Lord, I ask that your spirit would work in us and among us tonight. Lord, there may be those areas that we have neglected to have only you. And Lord, I pray that tonight, I pray that tonight we would turn back to you. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. This morning we looked at the first part of this particular set of verses. He begins to preface the Ten Commandments with a claim to be God. I am the Lord thy God. He prefaces everything else that follows by the statement, I am Jehovah. I am the self-existing one. This morning and the last few weeks have been challenging us. We only need God because he is worthy. And he alone is worthy. Anything else is a cheap trinket. A cheap substitute. Only God in our life. If you were to continue on in the passage, you would find toward the end or toward the middle, verses 18 or so, that the people heard the thunderings. They heard the noise of this. 
and they were afraid by the sound. I've known some people to be afraid of thunder and lightning before. Sometimes children are. I remember when my children were frightened by that noise. It can be loud. It can be just ear-splitting. Can you imagine the noise the Bible describes as thunderings, a noise so great and so powerful that the people as a whole, all of them, were afraid and stood afar off, the Bible said. Basically, we can't handle this. This is too much for us. If I can say it this way, they have come face to face with the self-existing ones, and he makes a demand. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. What would you say in that situation? If what was said and, 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 the, and what you observed and the noise that you heard, the noise that you heard was so great that it caused your knees to tremble and you to run scared, would you not say, well, that makes a lot of sense to me. Well, I can see why he's God. Tonight, I want to continue on a little bit in these particular verses as we look at verse 4 and 5. Where God begins to open up this command, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God as we look at this passage we must ask ourselves a couple of questions I think the first and not most obvious one being is what does God mean when he says don't make any likeness of anything on the earth does he mean you're not supposed to have a stuffed horse? Right? Is he saying that we can't take a picture of a Fifi the dog? Because we can't have any likeness of something on the earth. Is he saying, listen, I forbid you ever to have a picture of a fish, a dolphin, a shark, a unicorn, or whatever it may be. You're not supposed to have anything, no animals at all. Or is he saying, I don't want you to misrepresent me? I think it's obvious, is it not? I don't think the command is not to have a, a horse, a cat, or some other image, but that we don't misrepresent, that we don't mistake the worthy one, the self-existing one, Jehovah. Tonight I want to challenge us in two ways. One that our passion must be for God and only God. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And I don't believe, as I speak to this crowd tonight, that, that many of you have a figurine at home that you worship. I don't believe that you have in your house a a picture and you say, well, well, this is God. But I'm afraid that as, as modern Christians, we do mistake and misrepresent God himself. I want us to turn to one passage, just a few chapters away, Exodus chapter number 32. Remember, this is Exodus chapter 20. In Exodus 32, just 12 chapters later, just a little bit of time later, Moses is on the mountain and he's with God. God is speaking to Moses and communicating with Moses. The Bible says of Moses, no one else has, has been with God face to face. Moses, called the meekest man, the friend of God, Moses up on the mountain. And in Exodus chapter 32, the children of Israel, verse 1, saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount. And the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. We don't know what has become of him. Just a few short chapters later, the people have come to Aaron and said, Aaron, listen, you need to make us a god. We have a problem. 
Moses brought us out of Egypt, and now we don't know what's happened to him. The first mistake they made was mistaking the power of Moses. In Exodus chapter 20, the Bible says that God said, I brought you out of bondage. Moses happened to be the human messenger, the human instrument, but Moses did no more bring them out of Egypt, all right, than I can fly. It wasn't Moses' strength, his power, or his rod. It was the hand of God on Moses. And Moses hadn't really claimed to bring them out of Egypt. Now, later on, he makes some claims like that, but right here, he hasn't. And they said, listen, we don't know where Moses went. We're in trouble. We need a God. What does Aaron say? Now, remember, just a few chapters earlier, thunderings, all this noise, they've backed away, and God has said, no other God. It has not been years, just a little short time later. What does Aaron say? Verse number two, and Aaron said unto them, break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, of your daughters, and bring them unto me. You remember where they got the golden earrings from? Egypt. They were poor, broke slaves. And God rescued them. And on the way out, the Bible says that God allowed them to spoil, Bible word, the Egyptians. The, Egypt, the Egyptians showered them with gifts because of God's hand in the situation. And now the Israelites are extremely wealthy. And Aaron says, listen, you want a God? Then bring me those gold things. Or if I say it this way, they made a God out of the gifts of God. What a shame. What a shame that the gifts of God, the, the, the provision of God, the blessing of God, they would now worship as a God. This morning I mentioned a few false gods that we have in 2021. For some it's the God of money. And though we do not physically bow down in our house to the almighty dollar our lives revolve around making more of it oh we claim it's for a good cause but every decision that we make is to make sure that we're financially stable God of money mistaking the provision and blessing of God for only God I challenge this morning because some exalt the idol of family. And I love my family. Families are a gift of, from God, are they not? A prudent wife is of the Lord. Children are a heritage of the Lord, right? Fruit of the womb receives a reward. But I can, if I'm not careful, exalt the gifts of God and take the place of God. My kids have been able to play some soccer with some traveling teams. I do not tell you this to, to brag or, or anything, but just to say what we have done. We told them since day one that we will not miss church for a soccer game. They knew that. I also told them that they had shed one tear because of it. We were done. We went to the coaches, and they said we'd like them to play, and I said, listen... You can, but I'm a pastor over here. The kids are involved in church. We don't miss it. Church is the most important thing. So far, not been a problem. If it ever was a problem, you know what decision I would make? You can mark this spot in the YouTube video. You can mark this down, write this down. Soccer's out the door, and I love soccer. It's out the door. We took that stand. They've been gracious to us. You'll find that when you stand for the Lord, sometimes you get rejected and oppressed, but sometimes people just are encouraged that someone stands for something. The situation, they weren't, wasn't a problem at all. I love my kids, but I love God more. I'm raising my kids to leave my house and serve the Lord somewhere, wherever he calls them to. I gave them to the Lord like Brother Eric and Miss Jackie did. Dedicated their daughter to the Lord. My children are the Lord's. I don't 
worship them. My life doesn't revolve around my children. My wife is more important to me than my children. Men? My wife is more important to me than my children. That's from God's word. She is one flesh with me. Children are just here for me to steward and shoot them like an arrow so they can go on and serve God. Moms, your husband is more important to you than your children. If not, then you've elevated them above God because God says this. Only God. Children of Israel took the blessing of God, what was a provision of God, and Aaron said, break it off. And verse number four, he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he made a molten calf. And they said, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Verse number four always just intrigues me. And, and I, I chuckle hourly, hourly when I read this verse. They have taken the earrings out of their ears and, the, and their sons' ears and daughters' ears. They've put them in there and, and he fashioned them. And then as soon as they fashioned this thing with their own hands, they begin to say, look, this is the God that brought thee out. No, it's not. You just made it 30 seconds ago. Uh, it's not the God. You, ju <laughs> you, you just did this. Well, what they're saying is, this is what the Almighty God looks like, is what they're saying. Notice what Aaron goes on to say. Verse number five, when Aaron saw it, saw what? Saw the golden calf. He built an altar before, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, the Lord, Jehovah. Not a Lord, not a God, but Jehovah. And Aaron says, You know what? This is Jehovah. We're going to worship him tomorrow. We're going to have a feast tomorrow. And what God said in Exodus 20 not to do, the children of Israel so quickly, just a few, a little while later, made a physical representation, a misrepresentation of the Almighty God. You know how the story, you may know how the story ends. Moses on the mountain. God says, get down to the camp because there's a problem. Moses brings Joshua and Joshua says, uh, sounds like war down there. Sounds like war during our series on music. I talked about this passage. Joshua says the noise of war sounds like a racket, like chaos down there. And Moses says, no, that's not what you hear. What you hear is music and singing. Huh. So music that was involved in a pagan, idolatrous feast sounded like chaos. Music that didn't please God. I... No, they were not singing praises to Jehovah, false God, false idol worship. He came down and I believe it was 3,000. 3,000 people died over the course of this. Misrepresentation. You see, God doesn't want us to have a false view of him. If I have a false view of God, I am following a false God. If I have a false view of God, I am following a false God. God says, don't mistake me and don't misrepresent me. There are many false gods that have been crafted after what our minds have imagined him to be like. Many false ideas about God that we have crafted from our own imaginations. We will say things like this, well, God needs to always be fair as we deem fairness. Our view of fairness and God's view of fairness are two different things. And if we suppose that God is always, quote, fair, end quote, that is not what exactly what I read about in the Bible, but God is always right. God is always just. Others will say, well, God is always love as they deem love to be. God is always love, and because God is about love, then you can marry whomever, whomever you want to because God is just about love. A false view of God is a false God. Well, God is always understanding, and he understands me all the time, so he'll just excuse it. 
A false view of God is a false God. We worship a false God when we try to make God just what we want him to be. And I'm afraid that there are times in our life as Christians that because we will not be diligent here, we worship a false God here. False teachers abound everywhere. God doesn't care. He just loves you. Recently, I read this statement from a fairly well-known pastor now. He said, if I were the devil, and I wanted Christians to believe that God's love for them is conditional, I would not lead them to a preacher who blatantly says God's love is conditional. So you better not mess up. I would be much more subtle than that. I would lead them to a preacher who is constantly saying things like, how's your prayer life? Are you reading your Bible every day? When was the last time you shared your faith with someone? Are you handling your money in a way that glorifies God? And so on and so forth. In other words, I would lead them to a preacher who persistently peppered their minds with diagnostic questions about their spiritual life and their moral performance. I read that. This is, uh, if I told you his name, some would know and some would not know, but there are many who follow this particular particular pastor. Eloquent man. Eloquent. I have known people that would be associated in our particular, you know, Baptist circles to follow this this particular man and and love what he teaches and many things that he says and the way he says it. And, And he's gifted in his communication. Much more gifted than than I would be. But I read that. And he said, if I were the devil, if I were the devil, I would, the devil would lead people to a preacher who says, are you reading your Bible every day? Did you catch that? Are you handling your money in a way that pleases God? I would just address... uh, direct this man to a few portions of scripture if I could how about where Jesus said to the disciples why are you fearful sounds like a question does it not sounds like a diagnostic question does it not or how about where God said to Adam and Eve Adam where are you Sounds like a diagnostic question, does it not? Does it not? (laughs) How about where Jesus asked someone else, have you hardened your heart? Sounds like a diagnostic question to me, does it not? Or how about where Jesus asked Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Now understand, this man has said that the devil authors those questions. False view of God. Make no mistake, your view of God must come from God's word. Last week we preached on the word of God and spending time with God every single day for 21 days. So encouraged, over 250 people committed, whether here or online, and they texted me and said, Pastor, I'm committing. And I was just astounded. I was encouraged. And I'm thrilled that over 250 people from this particular local assembly would, 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 would commit to spend time with God for 21 days every single day. Can you imagine what God's Word can do in the hearts and lives of people who spend time in every day, and we must have a passion, and, but we cannot misrepresent God and mistake God. And if we're not careful, we will want God to be a certain way, but that will not be the way that he's represented here. We must get our view of God from the Word of God. You see, what happens is that people say, I would like to buy just $3 of this God. Not enough to disturb my sleep or to disturb my life, but just enough to warm me up. A warm warm glass of milk or a nice pillow, that's how much God I want. 
You see, what people want, what we want, is the sensation of God, not the transformation of God. We want God to just touch us. We want to see him work. We want to come to church and be encouraged and feel blessed. But we don't want the transforming power of God, a false view of God, because God is not content just to touch us. He demands a response. Thou shalt have no other gods. My passion must be for God. What do you love? What thrills you in the depths of your soul? Learning about God, finding some new truth in the Word of God, hearing an answer to prayer, knowing that God spoke to you or that God revealed himself in someone else's life or that he worked in a miraculous way. Does that thrill you to your soul or is it something else? You see, God wants to be known. The reason we know God is because of his Word. My passion must be for God for God and my purpose must be from God in Exodus 20 God says don't mistake me for something else he says because if you do that verse number 5 you'll bow down and serve him you'll bow down verse number 5 and he said don't do that I wonder if in your life there's a log jam there's a distraction, something else you're following other than God. There's a place called the Timberlands, and in springtime, they'll still move logs down the rivers. They say that when these logs are moving, that sometimes they'll have a log jam. And the lumberjacks will have to take their big pole, big tool. They have to find the one log that was hindering everything else. You know, in your life and in my life, there can be one log that hinders everything else. Apparently, they were able to take that pole and move that log, and once they move that log out of the way, everything flows freely. You see, no, no other gods it means he's on top. It means I know him for who he says he is. And it means that nothing else hinders him in my life. No other gods. I follow him. You see, when you follow a false god, and most of us don't follow a visible false god, we're just guilty of following what is visible to us. Paul says it this way, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, when Christ, who is our life. Years ago, there was a lighthouse. It was along a bleak coast tended by a keeper who was given enough oil just for one month and told to keep the light burning every single night. Story goes, one night... A woman came and asked for oil so that her children could stay warm. Noble request, heart-wrenching request, and the lighthouse keeper's heart was moved, and he gave her just a little bit of oil. A short time later, later a farmer came. His son was needing to read, and read and study for school so he'd go off and and have a good career and a good job and he needed just a little bit of oil to get through this last little bit of study he needed so the lighthouse keeper gave a little bit of oil to the farmer as well after that another came and then another and all worthy re requests and for each request the keeper was moved and measured out a little bit of oil near the end of the month Last night, the oil tank ran dry. That night, as the story goes, the beacon was dark. And three ships crashed onto the rocks. Lives were lost. There was an investigation afterwards. And the man was asked what had happened. As he stood before the judge, the judge said, You were given 
one task and one task alone. It was to keep the light burning. Everything else was secondary. You have no defense. And my fellow Christian, we have one task. Jesus, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Everything else must be secondary. We will have no defense. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I ask you to help us. Lord, there are ideas and thoughts and things that attempt to draw us and pull us away. Lord, I ask you to help us to be honest. Tonight, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, in just a moment, the instruments begin to play. I wonder if you can say with all sincerity and truth, it's only God, and nothing's hindering him. It's only God, and I know him the way he wants to be known, not just some loose interpretation that I wish he was or think him to be. It's only God, and there's no log jams there. You see, what we need is only God. What this world needs is only God. We are called to be light and salt. We are called to seek Him first. Lord, guide this invitation. Lord, may we respond in humility and sincerity. In Jesus' name, amen.